A loud noise startled Junpei awake, and his eyes snapped open. Hello one and all, this is Luckless Lovelocks. Welcome back to the final ending of 999. This is intense! I'm gonna jump forward down this path. Door four. Door seven. I'm going to do this part again. Outside the room. They stepped out of the captain's quarters and into another hallway. The hallway stretched out in front of Junpei for a bit, before turning left like a great backward L. Alright, let's go. Junpei rounded the corner and took off down the straightaway. He ran. And ran. And ran. At the end of the hallway was a door. That's the next door. He made straight for it. Wait, a piece of paper. He was nearly halfway to it when he noticed a piece of paper in the middle of the floor. Junpei skidded to a halt. This is... He dropped down to his hands and knees and quickly tore the paper off the floor. Map of the ship's interior for a deck. What's wrong? A slightly slower by virtue of his advanced age, he finally caught up to Junpei. I found a map for this floor. He showed Ace what he snatched from the wall. He looked at it long enough to determine what it was and nodded. I see. With that, he began running again past Junpei. Well, that was anticlimactic. I should keep this, though. Junpei shoved the map into his pocket and got up to follow Ace. But something stopped him. Hey, uh, where's Clover? He turned around. Clover was nowhere to be seen. Damn it, what the hell is she up to? Junpei muttered angrily under his breath and took off back the way he'd come. As he stopped around the corner, he saw her. She was standing in front of the door to the captain's quarters, her hand on the doorknob. Clover! Huh? As Junpei watched, she closed it, gently and quietly. <sighs> what the hell are you doing? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? Clover had unconsciously put her hands over the pockets of her jacket, as if trying to hide something. What the hell is that? What? You've got something in your pocket. What is it? Oh, this? Uh, um, this is... a note. A note? Yeah, I found it in the pocket of the guy with the captain's clothes. It said something about the darkness of the sinister hand or something. Oh! Oh! oh. This is different, right? Because she just ran off. This time she found a note. What the hell? Uh, let me see it. Uh, no, not right. But Junpei wasn't going to get to see it. From the other end of the hall, he heard Ace's voice. Hey, Junpei, Clover, what are you two doing? Hurry up. He's getting mad. Clover shrugged. I'll show it to you later, all right? Come on, we gotta hurry. That was the, uh, that was the hint for the code. For the safe, but also the code for the coffin. Before Junpei could protest, she was gone. Around the corner and off down the long stem of the L. Uh. A note. A note. Junpei was curious. But there was something else that bothered him. From the look of that pocket, it doesn't particularly look like just a note. Jeez. What are you thinking? Ah, for crying out loud. Junpei did his best to convince himself that it would make sense later, and ran off after Clover. <laughs> now 
Now I'm glad I decided to do this one. Junpei pushed through the door and found himself in a large room with a large set of stairs. The big stairs. Huh. So this is where it ends up. Just like it says on the map. It was just what he'd expected to see after reading the map. His I see after reading the map himself meant that Ace had probably realized the same thing. Ace, did he head down? He put his hand on the handrail and leaned over to look down. Oh, there he is. Look, the four others are there too. And not just Ace, Santa, June, Seven, and Lotus as well. Really? Let's join them. Junpei and Clover glanced at each other and hurried down the stairs. They reached B deck at the same time. Jumpy! Clover! June's face was excited. Something had happened that much Junpei could tell by simply looking at her. What's up? Given their situation, he was not inclined to be excited about sudden developments. June, however, couldn't contain herself. We found it! Found what? We found it! What did you find? The last door! We found door 9! What? Come on! Just follow us! We'll explain on the way! Okay. Seven turned and jogged off down the stairs. Well, if that's the case... Wait for me. We should get going as well. The rest followed. Jumpy! We finally made it! The relief and excitement in her voice echoed what each of them felt. Yeah, it's finally time. Junpei wasn't quite ready to believe they'd really done it. At least not just yet. Still, if everyone said that it was door 9, then it probably was. We've reached the end. He could feel his heart racing. A mixture of anticipation and fear ran through his veins. And he could feel his legs shaking. He was doing his best to maintain a sense of healthy skepticism, but he couldn't deny that the prospect of escape was an exciting one. But something's bothering me. Only three to five people can go through the numbered door. Seven of us are on our way to door nine. That means that, best case scenario, there will be two of us who have to stay behind. Two people. Is there a way? Junpei looked over at the clock. 4.30. We've only got 90 minutes left. I've got no time to wonder about it now. Hey! Junpei! June! What the hell are you two doing? Hurry it up! Santa's voice jolted Junpei out of his reverie. Let's go, Jumpy! Let's do it! June took off down the stairs, jogging as quickly as she could. Yeah. Junpei followed. I'm so excited! As a group, they piled onto the elevator and rode impatiently down to E-Deck. It looked familiar. There was a metal grate between the two elevators. Seven grabbed hold of it and began to talk. I know I told you I'd explain it earlier, but honestly, there ain't much to explain. After we split off from you guys, the four of us got into the elevator on the left, and that took us to the other side of the grate. After that, we headed down another hallway. It took us toward the bow and eventually to the number six that you two found earlier. We opened it and kept going. There was another locked door behind it, like usual, but this time we had to complete two different areas before we could unlock it. Once we were through that door, there was another hallway that went the other direction, toward the stern. So the two different areas would have been the engine room and the cargo room. So on your way, you found the elevator. That's right. So, in other words, you kind of did a lap, huh? You came from that side to this side. Yeah. With that settled, Junpei looked around. So, where's the number nine door? Over here. Follow me. Seven began walking, down the hallway that led toward the stern. Uh. Junpei and the others broke into a jog to keep up with him. By the way... They had been walking for a while, June in silent step with Junpei, when she spoke. 
You know, it's because of Santa that we're all here right now. Huh? That all seven of us are going to door nine. What? You don't get it? Santa, Seven, and Lotus, what's their digital route? Nine. Nine. It's nine. That's right. They could have just left me behind and kept going if they'd wanted to. But they didn't. Yes, because Santa wouldn't let them. He said, we can't leave June and the others behind. That's why we went looking for you guys. And then you got on the elevator and went back to the central staircase. That's right. Hmm. Well, uh, I wouldn't have called that one. Uh, that Santa would be the one to stick up for you, I mean. Junpei felt his eyebrows knit. He considered that. Oh, don't get me wrong. Perhaps Jun had sensed Junpei's concern. I don't mean that Seven and Lotus said they wanted to leave me behind. We were just talking about it, and Santa objected to it first. Is that so? Junpei was about to respond when... Seven suddenly stopped. We're here. In front of them stood a door. So, is this... Yeah. Junpei couldn't see Seven's face, but he could see him nod. There's no other place for us to go. Nope. Just look around. There's a big old iron wall at the end of the hallway. The other hallways on the left and right are blocked by metal grates. I see. Looked as though Seven was right. The door in front of them was their only choice. All right, let's get moving. He pulled open the door and walked in. <sighs> Junpei took a deep breath and followed. <sighs> it appeared they'd been telling the truth. No way. The first thing Junpei saw as he entered the room was the number. Nine. Like all the others, it was a rough thing, made of red paint. The door it decorated sat on the back wall of a rectangular room. <laughs> Junpei ran up to it. The nine door. It was a large double door with powerful styling. Something about it was almost majestic and it made the red paint look especially garish. We're finally here. Junpei grabbed the handle and shook. It didn't budge, but then he hadn't really expected it to. The red was bolted to the wall next to the door. This display red vacant. No doubt about it. This is door nine. <laughs> oh, finally. This is the last. Junpei felt a flood of emotion wash over him. He felt a chill down his back and his chest tightened, even as, he, as his blood began to boil. There was a moment of complete silence. Junpei, look behind you. He turned around. Behind? What? Junpei could scarcely believe what he saw. Why? A door and a nine. There's another one. Hey, what the hell? What the hell is going on here? His words came slowly and his brain struggled to understand what he'd seen. On shaky legs, he made his way to the second nine. It was a small door set parallel to the door they'd come through, but in the other corner of the room. Nine. There's no mistaking the number, and if any more proof is needed, a red was bolted to the wall near the door. There's a red there too! That means... And of course it won't open. He grabbed the handle and shook the door, not because he expected it to open, but because he had to make sure it was real. But why? Why the hell are there two doors? It was Ace who spoke first. Do you think perhaps one is the right door? And the other is the wrong one. Lotus was skeptical. I don't know about that. It seems unlikely. What makes you say so? Well, think about all the rooms we've been through so far. They're full of puzzles, but there are always hints about how to solve them. 
I'm pretty sure there aren't any rooms where we just had to go with our best guess and leave it to instinct to solve the puzzle. Do you really think that at the very end of the game, Zero's going to suddenly throw in something that depends entirely on luck? Then you're saying there's some sort of hint in this room? No, I don't think there's a hint anywhere in here. I searched it very well when I was in here before. I didn't find anything that might have been a hint, though. Hmm. Well then, that means... Yeah, both of these are the right door. I mean, she's kind of ignoring the coffin and the roofs. Like, something inside there could be a hint. I mean, if you think about it, Zero never actually said there was only one door with a nine on it. It is hidden, but an, but an exit, exit can, can be found. found. Seek, Seek a way out. out. Seek a door that carries a nine. Junpei began to mutter to himself. So if there are two number nine doors, if we split it up right, that's not gonna work. Junpei blinked and looked up at Clover. She held out her hand. You've got a notebook and a pen, right? Can I borrow them? Yeah, here. Slightly confused, he pulled them out and handed them to her. Look at this. Clover opened the notebook to a blank page and set it down on the desk. Everyone else gathered around her and watched as she wrote down a series of numbers. You get it? The numbers on the top are all the combinations with digital roots of nine. The numbers on the bottom are the people who don't fit. There's only eight possibilities if we split up into two groups of three or four people. So... If three people go through the door, then four are left behind. If four go through, then three are left behind. Right? Yeah. Clover nodded almost as if... She were pleased with herself for solving a difficult math problem. No way. <laughs> hmm. <sighs> oh. The room went very quiet. Silence lay across everyone like a thick, heavy blanket. No one spoke. Their faces were blank. Come to think of it. Desperate for something else to look at, Junpei turned his eyes to the room around him. What is this room? The walls were covered with candles. The wavering flame made the shadows of Junpei and his companions look as though they were dancing. Two rows of wooden pews filled most of the room. It looks like it's set up for some kind of ceremony, but what kind? Between them was a strip of rich red carpet. The carpet ran straight through the room, ending at the door that pointed to the stern of the boat. At the other end of the carpet... Is that an altar? It was a recessed space set into the wall between the two other doors. Sitting on a raised section of the altar was a coffin. Coffin, a coffin. A coffin? No, it, it couldn't possibly be. But if it wasn't, then whose body occupied it? That was as far as Junpei wanted to pursue that line of thought. He decided not to think about the coffin for the time being. At that moment, Seven spoke. There was an edge of humor to his voice, but it was forced. Okay, I give up. I give up. I figured if we sat around here long enough, someone would volunteer. But I guess nobody's got the guts to do it. What are you talking about? Junpei didn't understand, and he wasn't the only one. What? You guys didn't figure it out yet? <sighs> fine, fine, let me enlighten you. Clover was mostly right with her little explanation earlier, but she missed something. She wasn't really wrong, she just... Ah, screw it! Let me just write it out. Seven snatched up the notebook and began to write in it. 
Everyone else clustered around him, desperate for a look. If you're trying to leave with a group of three and a group of four and get everybody out, Clover's right. But there's another way. Only one combination, though. If you split us up into groups of three, three, and one, you can make this combination. Wait, this means... Don't get me wrong here. I'm not trying to copy Ace or anything like that. Even if he hadn't been the hero back in the big hospital room, I'd still be saying the same thing. The same thing? Are you saying... Yeah, I am. I'll stay behind. Uh... Huh? Uh... Huh? Huh? Why are you acting so heroic all of a sudden? Are you some kind of idiot? Lotus was the first to speak. That, in itself, was a little strange. She'd reacted much differently when Ace had volunteered. Now, I am completely against this. I'll be goddamned if I'm gonna have to owe you for getting out of here. The rest of them began to speak all at once. I'm against it too! I didn't want to leave Ace behind, and I don't want to leave you either! I don't like that idea. There's gotta be other options. I disagree as well. I can't say I care much for you being the hero. Finally, they quieted down. Junpei looked at Seven. Well, there you go, Seven. Proposal denied. Clover's right. There's got to be a better way than this. Seven made some noise that was somewhere between a derisive snort and a cough. Hmm. Doesn't make any sense. He was doing his best to pretend they were making a foolish decision. But Junpei could see the twinkling of water at the corners of Seven's eyes. That was when Santa spoke. Whoa, hold on a minute. I haven't said anything yet. Till then, Junpei hadn't realized that Santa had stayed quiet for the whole discussion of Seven's fate. Something in his voice made Junpei uncomfortable. Are you... agreeing? You want to leave him here? Santa shook his head. Nah, I'm against it. I don't want to leave Seven here alone. Then I don't see how it matters. I said alone. Huh? I said I don't want to leave Seven alone. There was a dull shine in Santa's eyes. They were cold and hard. Chunpei felt himself shiver. What the hell are you... What? You don't get it? I can't leave just one person. I need two more. Three people, including seven. I'll be leaving behind three people. That's my proposal. No, those are my orders. Here we go! What do you mean, orders? What the hell makes you think you can order us around? Who the hell's gonna listen to you? You all will. In three seconds, you won't have a choice. What? Three, two, one. Santa was so fast, Junpei could barely see him. When he moved, it was almost like watching a dance. His feet moving like lightning. He spun and... <coughs> he had June. See? I told you. His lips curled into a cruel, mocking smile. Huh? What? A shudder traveled the length of Junpei's spine. His chest froze, and he could feel his breath go stale in his lungs. Nothing made sense. Junpei felt as though his head were about to explode. Santa's sudden change in attitude, saying that he needed two more. The gun in his right hand, a revolver. Santa had grabbed June from behind and pressed what Junpei's shaken brain identified as a revolver roughly against her temple. Why? What the hell is that? Where on earth had Santa possibly found a gun? Junpei's question roared in his mind, but his mouth refused to ask them. Seven spoke, almost as though he had sensed Junpei's confusion. The gun's from the other room. What room? One of the rooms behind door six. I should have known he was going to do this. I should have taken the gun. <laughs> well, it's too late now, fat ass. Damn it. A mixture of fury and frustration twisted Seven's face as he glared at Santa. Santa, for his part, didn't so much as flinch. The corner of his lip twitched into a slightly wider smile. <laughs> then the smile faded and he began to move. 
He walked backward, dragging June with him. Before long, his back was resting against the door. On the wall next to him was the red. He put his hand on the scanner panel quickly, and then forced June to do the same. Now, time for you to start following my orders. Ace, Lotus, congratulations. I've chosen you to come with me. Put your hands in the red. That was what Santa had meant when he said he needed two more. Hey, you deaf? I gave you an order. Santa's eyes narrowed to slits. He glared at Ace and Lotus. <sighs> they stayed frozen like deer, cut in headlights of an oncoming car. Right, fine. I didn't want to waste any bullets, but you guys just don't get it. No sooner were the words out of Santa's mouth than his hand twitched. And the gun roared. A section of the floor exploded, scattering wooden splinters across the floor. A thin plume of smoke snaked out of the hole in the floor. Ha! There could be no doubt that the gun was real, and worked. He really shot it? But why? Santa, why are you... Clover's voice spoke of betrayal and disbelief. Santa, I thought... I thought you were one of us. I thought we were friends. What? You knew about the leaf words and the four-leaf clover. Santa's cheek twitched almost imperceptibly. What the hell is that shit? I've got no idea. You're lying! Shut up! Just shut up, you stupid bitch! You want me to put a bullet in your fucking head? Flex of spit flew from Santa's mouth, his face twisted with rage. Clover recoiled, her eyes wide, when she spoke. Her voice was very small. Santa! He snorted, then shook his head vigorously and turned to face Ace and Lotus. Alright, assholes! What are you still standing there for? Get over here and scan those bracelets! I don't have all day! Oh, what's the matter? Your hearing's starting to go? Going senile, maybe? Uh. <sighs> Ace and Lotus still didn't move. It almost seemed as if they couldn't move. June's face was pale behind Santa's arm. Her eyes were wild and her chest heaved with every quick breath, like an animal cornered by a predator. Junpei's mind worked furiously. What were they going to do? Then he realized something. There was nothing they needed to do. There was nothing to debate. That's it. June's safety was the first priority. That much was obvious. Doing as Santa had commanded meant that she would be safe from at least two threats. She wouldn't be shot and she would leave the ship alive, along with Santa, Ace, and Lotus. There was only one thing for Junpei to do. It's the only way. He turned to Ace and Lotus. Please, go. Huh? No way. Jumpy, what are you saying? If you stay here, you're going to be stuck, Jumpy! And so will Clover and Seven. I know, but you don't need to worry about us. We'll figure something out. Right, Seven? Uh, right! You just leave it to us. It's gonna piss me off to do what Santa says, but... Don't worry about me, either. There's still something I have to take care of. No! No! You can't! Ace! Lotus! Don't come over! Don't worry about me! Please! June was almost crying. <laughs> Junpei walked around behind Ace and Lotus. He gently placed a hand on each of their shoulders. Please. And pushed them toward the door. Uh. <sighs> they almost stumbled, then righted themselves and took another step. And another. <sighs> they turned around and Junpei nodded. Go. All right. Fine. Ace and Lotus turned around again and walked slowly toward the door, where Santa was waiting for them. After what seemed like an eternity, they stepped in front of the door marked nine. Santa smiled. All right. Now let's get those hands on the scanner panel. 
<sighs> What's the hold up? What? You think I'm fucking around here? I don't give a shit about this girl. The red doesn't need a person, you know? All I need is the bracelet. You get it? Good. Now put your fucking hands on the scanner. I'm not gonna say it again. He shoved the revolver harder against Shun's head, and she winced. Fine. Ace sighed, defeated, and placed his hand on the scanner panel. Lotus went next. <sighs> Lotus glared at Santa and slammed her hand onto the scanner panel. The fourth asterisk blinked on. Good job. Now, Lotus, pull that lever. As soon as the door opens, you get your ass in there. Try anything stupid, and you know what happens, right? Damn it. Junpei could almost hear Lotus's teeth grind. The door slid open. Door number nine opened at last. It opened with a low, powerful rumble, a drum roll to welcome the chosen few. Good. Go. Lotus and Ace walked through the door, their eyes furious but defeated. Santa waited until they were all the way inside, then hauled himself and June across the threshold as well. Later. After exactly nine seconds, the door swung shut. The gust of air created caused the candles on the altar to flicker and die. <sighs> The room fell silent. Junpei, Clover, and Seven had been left behind. Uh. Clover looked down at her hand and traced with her finger the faint blue veins that crisscrossed them. <sighs> Seven shoved his arms into the front of his overalls and scratched his stomach. No one spoke. Silence made the air feel thick and oppressive. <sighs> Desperate for something, anything to occupy his mind, Junpei walked to the larger of the two nine doors. He stood in front of it and looked at the red. It read, engaged. He moved to the smaller door. The red, red, vacant. The digital root of the remaining people was seven. There was no possible way for them to open a door with nine on it. Junpei touched the surface of the door. June. He thought about June, but Akane Kurashiki. Was she safe? That was all that mattered to him. If she was alive, if she'd escaped this horrible boat. <sighs> That was what Junpei prayed for. Seven came up next to him. He pulled off his hat, scratched his head, and sighed. So, what do you want to do, Junpei? What do you mean, what do I want to do? What can we do? Seven opened his mouth to respond when... A noise echoed through the room. Someone was pounding on something vigorously. It wasn't mechanical, it was certainly human. Junpei and Seven looked at one another. What the hell is that? Shh, quiet! Clover motioned to Seven to be quiet. She put one finger on her lips and closed her eyes in concentration. Here we go. Is this gonna work? The three of them listened, trying to determine where the sound was coming from. Where is it coming from? Could it be? Uh, hey, I think it's coming from this coffin. You're right. Let's open it. But how? What are those muscles for? For show? You're telling me to force it open? Just shut up and try! Junpei and Seven grabbed hold of the coffin. They tried to get a good grip, 
with what little purchase they could find, and pulled with all their strength. Damn it! Man, it won't even budge! There was some sort of keypad attached to the coffin. Its purpose would not have been difficult to determine. Their eyes were almost immediately drawn to it. Not another one. Yeah, looks like it. Do you think we have to put in the right password or it won't open? I think so. The noise wasn't stopping. In fact, it was getting louder. Whoever or whatever's inside this thing wants out, and now. I know that. But how? <sighs> Without a passcode, I, I don't think there's much we can do. They couldn't even tell how many numbers the passcode needed to be. Isn't there a hint somewhere? Well, let's look for one. Unfortunately, there didn't seem to be anything near the coffin. Clover ran to examine the pews and Seven investigated the desk, but they turned up nothing. Ugh, there's nothing here! Not making this easy, are they? The sound still wouldn't stop. It wasn't a noise that belonged in that room. <sighs> What's the passcode? What am I supposed to do? How can we figure it out? I need something. The world blinked. Suddenly there was a voice inside of Junpei's head. <gasps> truth had gone, truth had gone, and truth had gone. Ah, uh, now truth is asleep in the darkness of the sinister hand. Wait, what? What the hell was that? That voice? Junpei was utterly and completely baffled. Huh? What? What's up? Seven and Clover ran over to him, but Junpei didn't know what to tell them. Huh? If he told them he'd heard a voice, they'd laugh. Or worse, think he was going insane. So all he said was, Oh, um, <clears throat> uh, nothing. The note! He cleared his throat a little too loud and looked pointedly down at his bracelet. A pair of small buttons protruding from either side of it. Junpei. Press the buttons. I think it was right, left, right, left, right, left. That was it. I don't, I don't, I don't think I have to write this down, do I? I think I wrote it down before. We don't have it here anymore. Eight numbers blinked on and off on the bracelet display. Last time I didn't have to write it down. Junpei checked one last time. Just in case. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. Huh? Huh? Hey, what the hell were those numbers? Oh my gosh, are those... Huh. <sighs> Junpei didn't answer. He simply walked straight to the coffin. This is where this all the theories come together. We're, we're able to communicate to ourselves over time and... and I don't know, different dimensions, the morphogenetic field. He knelt down in front of the keypad, running over the numbers in his head so that he wouldn't forget. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. With trembling fingers, he punched them in.
one four three eight three four two one that was all of them he punched the e button there was a moment of complete silence then there was the sound of the coffin lid unlatching someone sat up out of it huh. no way what why are you Oh? Is that you, Clover? I apologize for worrying you. Snake! You? Why? Junpei? And Seven? Is that you? Is everyone else there as well? Just like Rip Van Winkle. Still, it was very much like Snake to simply cut to the heart of the matter and ask. Oh. <laughs> Jeez. Junpei and Seven shared a wry smile. Clover's eyes were filled with tears. You're, you're back! With a cry of joy, she leapt into Snake's arms. Gently now. My body's still a little weak. Oh, you're back! Clover looked like nothing so much as a lost child would finally found her home. She cried and cried and cried. Her eyes were red and her nose was running. She hiccuped and gasped, as if she were about to begin hyperventilating. You're back! You're really here! It's nice to have some hope again. After all the horrible things we've been through. Her voice was happy but almost desperate, as if she feared he would disappear again if she stopped talking to him. Tear after tremendous tear rolled its way down her face. Her small arms strained as she clutched Snake's body as tightly as she could. Perhaps she had to convince herself he was real. Perhaps she was worried he would be gone the moment she let go. Perhaps she simply didn't know what else to do. <laughs> You're back. Come now, what's gotten into you? You're acting as though I've returned from the grave. Though you did, I really thought you were dead. Huh? <laughs> you jerk! Idiot! 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 <sighs> Clover broke into sobs so great she could no longer talk. It was a touching reunion between brother and sister. Even though Junpei knew they had little time, and every minute they waited was a minute they wasted. It felt cruel to pull them apart. Junpei and Seven sat down on one of the pews, waiting for Clover to calm down, before explaining to Snake what had transpired. I see. I believe I understand things rather well now. Thank you. In the shower room, there is a dead body wearing my clothes. Because of that, you thought that I was dead, correct? It quickly and neatly summarized the events of several hours. Yeah. Junpei nodded. You also discovered a corpse in the captain's quarters, and Santa turned on you here, in this room. Do I have it straight? Well, the dead body in the captain's quarters is a surprise. Sorry, there wasn't a good time to tell you. Don't worry about it. Well then, I've got a pretty decent idea of what happened while I was indisposed, but it's still something of a mystery who did all this and why. The corpse in the shower room that looked like me, and the corpse in the captain's quarters. Why were they killed in the way they were? You don't know? No. Why would I? The guy in the shower room. We don't know who he is, so let's just call him Mr. X. Anyway, this Mr. X is wearing Snake's clothes. But you're wearing some kind of weird robes. That means someone took your clothes and put them on Mr. X. We need to figure out who that was. I apologize, but I have no idea who might have done this to me. I only just now woke up. I was unconscious during all the events you just described to me. 
They must have undressed me and changed my clothes during that time. When were you knocked out? When we split up to look for the red. Where did they get you? Do you remember? It was a small room in one of the hallways on sea deck. What happened? The same thing that happened to every one of us when we were abducted. A canister releasing some sort of gas was thrown into the room. I believe the gas is some sort of incapacitating agent. Then that means it was... Zero. Looks that way, huh? There's nothing else I have to tell you. When I woke up, I was in this coffin. Hmm. Junpei crossed his arms and thought. Why? Why did Zero make Mr. X wear Snake's clothes? How would that benefit Zero? I don't get it. What the hell does any of it mean? And I have no idea how I got the passcode for the coffin either. Truth had gone, truth had gone, and truth had gone. Where did those words come from? Why did I feel compelled to push the buttons on the bracelet after hearing them? Severin asked him about it while they waited for Clover to finish crying. He'd had no answer for him then, and he still didn't. All I know is my fingers moved on their own. It was like I did it subconsciously. I don't get it. What the hell does any of it mean? His mind was a maelstrom of mysteries, clues, theories, and more mysteries. He could barely think. <sighs> also, Snake and Clover had been subjects in a similar experiment nine years ago. The ability to access a morphogenetic field is affected by a couple of things. The first is epiphany, and the other is danger. And... and... someone did actually die. A girl. Her name was... There had been another experiment conducted on this same ship nine years ago, and a girl had died during it. Morphogenetic field theory. The two murders. Switching clothes. The nonary game. And whatever strange thing was happening to Junpei himself. The maelstrom in his head spat out words and ideas. They disappeared back into it almost as soon as he grasped them. <sighs> but as he struggled through them, Junpei began to realize something. 